So we are in the fourth uh, and final sermon of a series on uh, worship, the journey of worship. We're going to be looking in the gospel, the book of Acts, chapter 2, but let's pray first. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all your love and tender mercies to us. Thank you that we can be in the house. We thank you that your church reaches all times and places, and what a wonder, O oh Lord, that we can um, baptize a child who lives in Singapore and uh, realize that it's all in the family, all one in Christ. And how glad we are that from the beginning, your people have devoted themselves to the teaching, to the prayers, the fellowship, and the breaking of the bread. So come and speak to us about that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in Acts chapter 2, this is the story of the first gathering of believers after Peter's first sermon when many, many came to Christ. Listen to God's word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and they held all things in common. They were even selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's start with a wonderful gospel story. What we just read takes place right after the birthday of the church, right after the first Pentecost Sunday when the Spirit fell upon the apostles and they were speaking the praises of God in all the known languages of the people who'd gathered in the multi-ethnic, multicultural city of Jerusalem. And as the people gathered around and wanted to know what is this that's happened, Peter stood up and he gave the first gospel sermon. He told the story of Jesus. And as he told of the wonders that Jesus did, of how he died and how he rose, he turned to them and he turned it straight at them with what has to be the all-time greatest sermonic slap in the face. He said, know this for certain, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Now that's something to say. You think about it, Jesus was crucified 52 days at least earlier on Good Friday. How could the thousands of people who were in Jerusalem now, 52 days later, have been the people who called for Jesus' death? There might have been some overlap, but surely not all of them. And most of the people who listened were ordinary citizens. They had no power to put Jesus to death. How presumptuous is Peter being saying to this crowd nearly two months later, you put Jesus to death? His very first sermon of the Christian church, he's talking about a deeper problem. It wasn't just the religious officials or the Roman governor and his soldiers that put Jesus to death. It was a human problem. It was the depth of our common response to God's offer to come save us and rescue us in the person of his son. God loved the world so much that he sent his only son. We took one look at his son and said, no thank you. Too much. Too much reality. Too much calling to change my life. I'm not doing it. It was the depth of the no inside every human heart that put Jesus to the cross. Now Peter was no hypocritical preacher. He knew himself what it meant to deny his Lord in front of others, not once but three times. He put himself in the midst of the crowd when he said this. Know this for certain that you put Jesus to death. Text tells us they were pierced to the heart. They cried out. The crowd roared out. Brothers, what shall we do? I'm undone. I'm exposed. My great no to God's plan of salvation has been revealed. What should I do? Well, Peter didn't leave them dangling. He who had denied Christ and known bitter tears of despair also knew what it was to be restored by the same Jesus. It was the gospel that convicted them, the gospel that would heal them. So he just told them, repent, turn around, be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. 
For this promise is to you. It's to your children. It's to everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. And that day there were more than 3,000 baptized. That's a good preaching Sunday, if you ask me. 3,000 converts, one sermon. Think what's going on here. The entire pattern in Scripture that we talked about last week is being revealed. Revelation, conviction, forgiveness, and sending. The revelation was Peter told the story. Jesus was this man of God who did mighty works. You put him to death. God raised him from the dead. He is Lord in Christ. There's the truth. Conviction. It was your sin that put him to death. They cried out, what should we do? Forgiveness. Repent, believe the gospel, and you'll have forgiveness, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And then the sending, because the work of the Spirit is to bear witness that we've seen that Jesus is alive, that we've felt him in our hearts. When you receive the Spirit, you become a witness, you are sent. Revelation, conviction, forgiveness, sending, it's all here in this passage. Worship was the beginning of the church. Great deal, wonderful deal, beautiful passage. And in the beginning, there was this kind of blush of new love. Acts 2 tells us these guys were on fire. They were in awe. Can you imagine coming to church, gathering and thinking, I'm in awe. People are being healed. People are being converted. They're being forgiven and redeemed. They were so excited, they sold their possessions and shared everything with each other. And all the people didn't resent them. The entire crowd, city, gave favor to the Christians as they saw what was happening. And they shared their lives together, it says, with glad and generous hearts. These were great days. But you know, just like that first blush of love has to mellow into the day-to-day work of a marriage, the same would be true for the church. Church could not live in Acts 2. There would be internal strife. That would lead to division in the church that had to be worked on to be healed. The Jerusalem church would know poverty. They'd sold off all their capital, and a few years later, they needed a collection from the other churches to keep them afloat. And the favor of the city would turn to persecution by Acts chapter 6 and 7. Couldn't always be that way, but there were four practices named in this passage that would sustain them. When the new wore off, when the going got tough, these same four practices would be the bedrock of the church through the centuries. It's all in verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Four really simple activities that form the church around worship and give us the life and the power and the vision to be sustained in Christ. I love that that word is devoted. I looked it up and it means to pursue intently knowing that there will be obstacles. Isn't that a great way to think of it? Devotion, this word, is to pursue intently knowing there will be obstacles. To not be surprised, oh, I'm devoted until there's trouble. No, I'm devoted knowing there's going to be obstacles. Obstacles inside me, obstacles without me. They devoted themselves to these things. So I'd like to take the next part of the sermon and go through these four activities with you, kind of hopefully show you how they're operative in our church, and then close with an example of all four at work in one magnificent worship service. So first, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now that's interesting. There were probably some confirmation student knows. How many apostles were there originally? Twelve, right. Good job. Didn't sound like a sixth grader, but that's okay. (laughs) But you remember, they lost one, right? Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And when he realized what he had done and what it was going to cost, sadly, he, he hung himself. So in the beginning, in Acts 1, we read that the apostles that were left had to replace the one. They wanted to make it 12. So this is really interesting because in seeing how they replaced Judas, we see what it meant to be an apostle. They said, all right, let's pick somebody. They ended up picking Matthias, but these were the qualifications. He has to have been with us from the beginning, seen Jesus' ministry from start to finish, and he has to have been a witness to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In other words, the apostles' teaching 
was the recalling of all that Jesus said and did. That's what apostolic teaching is, to say, we saw, we heard, this is what Jesus did, this is how Jesus died, I saw him alive, I am a witness that the dead Jesus got up, he's Lord of all. That's wonderful, that's still the task of the church today. We devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. But what's great is, this is not an echo of an echo of an echo of an echo. This is living knowledge. The wonder is because our Savior isn't dead but is living, He's not a principle but a person, when someone hears the gospel and believes it, we receive the Holy Spirit. Christ lives in us and we become immediate witnesses to, I've felt it. Jesus is alive. I know it. He's working inside me. I'm changing. I feel peaceful, not anxious, forgiven, not guilty, hopeful, not despairing over death. The church is not like a group of people that studies a collection of ancient sayings and says, that's a nice way to live, sort of a guideline for your life. We're not following the latest self-help book about do these five things and your life will be prosperous. We are passing on a living story that when we hear it in faith, transforms us with a living reality. The other great thing about the apostles' teaching is that the apostles were interpreting the Hebrew Scriptures. They were saying, hey, we heard Jesus, we saw Him, He's what everything in the Hebrew Scriptures was pointing to. We look at all of Scripture, which was just the Old Testament, through the lens of the person and words of Jesus. When you hear people say, well, you know, you can interpret the Bible any way you want. It says lots of things to lots of people. We need to be able to tell them, for Christians, that's not so. For 2,000 years, we've interpreted the Bible through the lens of the apostles' teaching. It is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that tells us how to interpret Scripture rightly. So when we say the Apostles' Creed, or sing it like we did this morning, we're not rattling off a checklist of some doctrinal statements. We are speaking a living story that unlocks everything. The Apostles' Creed is the history of the career of Jesus. It is still the chief work of the church today. We devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, secondly, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. There's a connectedness that occurred. Those who share the Spirit of Christ, who've believed the news of His resurrection and have received the Spirit, are knit together. I love that this still happens. When we had our last new members class, it was a great class, 27 folks who are joining our church next month. And I asked them, so what makes for a great church experience? What makes for a great church? And among all the things they said, this one kept coming up. They said connectedness, a sense of belonging, feeling like you're part of a group of people who are doing something and believing something with you. Isn't that beautiful? This past winter, we had a special worship task force that was examining worship in our church, and we were noting the values and the qualities of worship that we have here, and one of the most precious ones that came out was this intangible sense of being family, this sweet sense of fellowship that we experience, this sense of delight at being in one another's company. It's something that you can't quantify, but you can feel it. And it's precious to us. It's a gift of His Spirit. It's something we're devoted to. I love to tell new members, what you feel when you're in the sanctuary, I can tell you now after 12 years, is real. If you put yourself out the least bit to interact with this congregation, you will discover that in times of difficulty or great joy, there will be Presbyterians there. It'll happen. We swarm hospitals. We pick up kids, we bring food, we take over work shifts. Whatever it takes, we stand with one another in thick and thin. Two weeks ago, we had two of our active members at Women's Hospital, Susie Tucker and Cheryl Lott. And Elizabeth and I went over to visit them in the afternoon. The surgeries were successful. It was June. I thought it was a Christmas party. It was ridiculous. Presbyterians had come, filled the waiting room. One woman who was a friend of Susie's was having a birthday. It was her birthday, so they brought cake. 
and they brought cake to the staff. So the receptionist in women's hospital is eating cake from the Presbyterians while the Presbyterians are yakking it up and praying with each other and crying and caring. You can't make this up. You can't manufacture it. It's this precious quality of fellowship. All you have to do is put your toe in and be swept up in the sea of that delight. The first Christians devoted themselves to that. They realized we've got to be together. We know it. That's why we're having a special focus on small groups in the fall. We've got to be devoted to one another to know the joy of Christ. Okay, so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and thirdly, to the breaking of the bread. Now, there's breaking of the bread is mentioned twice in Acts 2, 42 and 46. The first time, scholars like R.C. Sproul, Ken Bailey, the ESV Study Bible all say that refers to the Lord's Supper because actually there's a, a the in there to the breaking of the bread. It didn't get translated in the ESV. I don't know why it should have been. Different than down below, they went from house to house breaking bread, generic. You can have salami and still be breaking bread because you're eating together. But in particular, the scholarly consensus that the early church devoted itself to having communion whenever they worshipped. They heard the stories from the apostles of what Jesus said and did, and then they repeated the words of what Jesus said when he had the Last Supper and the Passover meal with them. They would break the bread and share the cup. Now, why would they do that when Passover was an annual feast, not a daily or weekly feast? It's really interesting. Jesus, in the upper room, was celebrating the Passover, the celebration of God's mighty act of deliverance, where he passed over the sins of the people and then led them to pass through the waters of the Red Sea into freedom. Well, from the beginning, the earliest Christians realized Jesus made that meal about himself. He went on to be the Passover on the cross, so God passes over our sins because he took the wrath of God on the cross and he is the pass through because he went through the waters of death and came out in resurrection and joined to him. We have everlasting life. He is our Passover. And from the beginning, every time they gathered was a mini resurrection day. That's why we moved worship from the Sabbath day, Saturday, to Sunday, the first day of the week, because Jesus rose then. That's why in June, we can sing Christ is risen from the dead as we did, because every Sunday is a resurrection Sunday. Christ, our Passover, has died and risen for us. So the first Christians said, we want to talk about this. We want to share this gospel bread and this gospel cup every time we gather. I'm so excited that for the next six Sundays in a row, we'll be sharing communion together. Five Sundays in July and then the first Sunday in August. Because it is the chief sign of our unity that Christ has given us to be joined as one to him and with one another. And we're going to do it all kinds of ways. We're going to come forward. We're going to stay in the seats. We're going to gather in groups. But each time as the worship services have a different flavor, we're going to be formed around his supper. We're going to engage that which the earliest Christians were devoted to. So they were devoted to the apostolic teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Prayer characterized the early church. We take it for granted that we can simply speak and God will listen. For centuries, think about pagans. They would have to offer blood sacrifices or slice themselves or, or offer their own daughters in prostitution or sacrifice their own babies to try to get an indifferent heaven to listen to them. People did not know, how can I get God to hear me? Am I alone in the world? Look at all of your agnostic and atheist friends today who are crying out, thinking, I'm alone. I don't believe in a God. It's just me trapped in my skull. And we have this treasure. All I have to do is lift my awareness off myself for a second. And I find that my Father is there. The creator of heaven and earth is inclining his ear to me listening with all his intent to my feeble croaks. What a gift. The spirit within us who cries out, Abba, Father, because we've been joined to Jesus by hearing the gospel, prays in us. Now, the first duty of church in prayer is not asking for things. The first duty of prayer is praise, to acknowledge who God is before him 
to describe his glories back to himself, to reflect his mighty deeds. The earliest church was characterized by mighty prayers of thanksgiving and praise. If you want your intercession to be effective, start with praise. If you want to know the heart of God for the people that you're concerned about, start with praise and give thanks. Otherwise, you're just talking to Santa Claus and you may or may not be on the nice list. Praise locks us into the heart of God, the heart of God for other people. Just parenthetically, I keep wanting to say this. That's why I like to use praise songs as intercession for people I'm concerned about. When I'm singing Christ is risen, I'm not just singing it. I'm bringing in my lost brother-in-law. I'm bringing in friends of mine that I know need to know the gospel. I'm singing as if they were singing it. That's how I'm praying for them, in praise. If you're ever bored singing, you're not interceding enough while you're praising. Okay, I just got to say that. Do the work. Pray, praise, and prayer together. All right, I slapped you. Let me praise you. I love how much this church prays. I love, particularly at this service, how many prayer cards we get every week now from children, for things beyond. I've got a hangnail. Deep, deep prayer requests. I love that our elders gather on Tuesday morning and go through those prayer requests, and then two hours later, our staff does the same thing. I love that our staff takes four families a week, working our way through the alphabet, and lifts them up in prayer at our meetings. I love that between the sanctuary services, there are people gathered in that little room by the elevator to pray for those, particularly who have healing needs. I love that there are people who, without any fanfare, before we ever arrive here, have gathered in a room to pray for our services. I love that we open every meeting at our church with prayer, that we pray in our Sunday school classes, that you pray spontaneously with each other. I love that on Sunday night, a faithful group gathers and prays for the world. I love that Whitney and his team have called us to join in with thousands of other Christians in praying for the Muslim world these 30 days, to ask God to show dreams and visions to Muslims. And I heard statistics this last week. Muslims are coming to Christ like no time in history, like no time in history. Their own violence from the extremist is leading other Muslims to Christ. It's a miracle, and we can keep praying about that. <clears throat> they devoted themselves to the prayers. Apostolic teaching, fellowship, the sacrament, the prayers. These are the elements of worship that make a church vibrant. Well, let me close, try to bring it all together, an experience I had. I told you about this a few years ago, but I thought of it again as one of the most meaningful worship services in my life. <clears throat> and meaningful because I was in the pew, not in the pulpit. <clears throat> it happened that Several years ago, I was coordinating the Presbytery Pastors Retreat, and so I had asked a longtime friend of mine, Dr. Wynne Kenyon, from Belhaven University to come and be our speaker. Now, my family's been connected with Wynne forever. He was Rhonda's first youth pastor when he was doing his PhD in philosophy at the University of Miami, and he, um, Rhonda's sister married his brother, so somehow we're all connected with these guys. Wynn and Jenny Kenyon have been part of our family's lives for as long as I can remember. And it was always an odd thing to me that in difficult times in my life, even though I didn't speak to Wynn regularly, somehow he showed up. Somehow we would have a conversation. Somehow, when I was wandering in my theology, he would spend hours patiently leading me back to the truth. When my ministry was being challenged um, at the depths with a threat that could have split our church in North Carolina, it just happened to be that Wynn showed up. It moves me still. Somebody who would say, you're going to get through this. This is going to be your finest hour. My dad did it. This is how he did it. You do it. So I was excited to have him come. He led our pastor's retreat wonderfully. It's glorious. It's great to see him. I did what I did just now when I introduced him. I cried. It was just so emotional to me to be connected to this guy who was a mentor to me for years. Well, 12 days after our pastor's retreat, Age 64, when had a massive heart attack. He died at Belhaven College in the hallways near his office doing what he loved to do, teaching students. Way too soon. He was a vigorous, humor-filled. His laugh would echo through the hallways, mentoring kids, 
He's just like, why, Lord? Why would you take this guy so suddenly in really what was the prime of his work? Well, they had a huge... I wasn't the only one touched by this guy. They had to have two three-hour visitations, one at their church, one at Belhaven University. They just couldn't accommodate the overwhelming sense of people who wanted to come forward to say, this guy touched my life. This guy changed me. This guy taught me who God is. It was glorious. And they couldn't have the service at their church because their church was too small. They had it in the biggest auditorium at Belhaven. We arrived, went back to where the family was just to meet them, to pray with them, to look at them. And then Rhonda and I went, took our place in the auditorium. And I have rarely longed for a worship service more in my life. I absolutely required that worship. I needed to hear the truth of the gospel in the face of loss. And so there was a constant and continual conversation going on in my head, though I never said a word. The auditorium was packed out. We sat and watched. We watched as the family came in. And if you've been through it, you know there is no lonelier walk on the face of the earth than a bereaved spouse walking across the sanctuary to his or her seat. We looked at her. There she is. There's Jenny. She's smiling. She's not letting this go. Look at her. She's gathering her chicks. She's got them all around her. She's a brick. How can she do it? They were best friends. She won't give in. Sat down. There's to be a prelude. I looked at the bulletin. There's a rendition of Psalm 91 written by Wynne's niece to be sung by another niece. Oh my gosh, are they going to be able to get through it? They love their uncle. How can this be? They could. They did. Beautiful, a cello and a clear voice singing. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, Thou art my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Yes, I thought. Yes, be our refuge. I need it. I need it. What's next? The call to worship from Psalm 61. Oh, absolutely. All you need to do, pal, I thought to myself, to the worship leader, is get the words into space. Just vocalize them enough that they float in the air. The psalm will do the rest. We stood and heard, Hear my cry, O God. Give heed unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth have I called unto you. Lead me to the rock that's higher than I. My soul cried out, Yes, yes, we are at the ends of the earth in this loss. We are sinking in the sea of loss. Lead me. Lead me to the rock that's higher. Yes, what do you have for me? Beyond hope, first song, in Christ alone. In Christ alone, we stood up. The auditorium thundered. Thundered. We needed to sing it. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final death, Jesus commands my destiny. Yes, we need to sing that. I want to bang on the seats. Death reaches in and steals a good man, but he doesn't command our destiny. Jesus does. The powers of the world want to say, we're in charge, we're louder, we're stronger. No, you're not. Listen to the witnesses. Listen to the sound. Jesus commands our destiny. We sat down, it was time for the scripture lesson. I looked at my bulletin again, 1 Corinthians 15. Again, I thought to myself, all you got to do is get to the microphone, read the words. You don't have to even speak them loudly. Just get them out. If you can mean them, all the better. I got to hear this. I got to hear it. Beyond hope, the words were vocalized. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be raised. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? This is rock and roll worship. Good beyond hope. The truth of the gospel spoken out amidst tears, unquenchable. I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop rejoicing. This is the mystery of Christian realism. We laughed with the mirth of heaven to hear stories about when. 
we shuddered and squeezed each other's hands so hard, thinking of what Jenny and the children would go through without him. It's all true. It's all one. And the news is all good. Sometimes we have to go up on the cross. Sometimes we have to stare out on Golgotha as we understand that death has a strong, cold hand. But as we gaze through worship, we see more. The hand nailed to the cross is the hand raised in blessing. The place of the skull is flowering with resurrection green. Things get awful, but at the deeps of reality, all is well. Christ is risen. He has the last word. No wonder they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. I've got to know that week by week so when it hits the fan, I know what's true. To the fellowship, we've got to hold on to each other. To the breaking of bread, where we get connected to Jesus in the most profound way possible. And to the prayers. Worship's not optional. It's life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being true in the worst possible places. Thank you for giving us the gift of worship and community gathered around your word and sacrament that brings us to the very heart of life. Would you continue to minister that way to us now? In your name we pray, amen.